Let me just. So, hello, Steve, Professor Stephen Weatherford of Cardiff University is going to talk to us about student mediated learning and personal learning networks during the transition to and through higher education. Over to you, Steve. Hey, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for, um, for coming along. Um, I've just popped a, a link in the chat, um, which I'll mention in just a moment. So I'll just share my screen. And thank you for the chance to, to talk to you today. Come on. There we go. <clears throat> so, yeah, so I wanted to talk about um, some work and some insights I've got looking at student transition and the development of, of self-regulated learning, which I rather arrogantly have renamed. Um, so uh, one thing I'd like you to do whilst I'm doing my sort of little preamble is um, I'll put this link in the chat. Uh, it's to a Mentimeter thing. If you uh, either click on the link or go to menti.com and type in those numbers or just get your mobile phone and hold the, uh, the camera over that QR code, it'll ask you to uh, um, pop a couple of, uh, of words or concepts in. Um, about what the what you think are the major challenges that students face um, when they first come um, to university. So in the transition from school um, to university, and I'll, I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. <clears throat> so I'm from uh, Cardiff University, and uh, Cardiff's in, in the capital city, Wales, uh, which is in uh, the southern part of Wales, and it's a fairly large university, 33,000 students. Um, it's the fourth largest in the UK, I think. Um, in the School of Biosciences, we have about 1,800 students all told of taught um, courses, but we also teach the preclinical and medical, medical and dentistry courses as well. Um, I'm particularly interested in how students develop self-regulated learning strategies, so how they learn how to learn um, when they come to university, and particularly how they study outside of the classroom. I'm interested in the sort of strategies they use, the methodologies they adopt, um, and how they develop those skills and how they change over time. Initially, my research with, was with year one undergraduate students, but it's developed since then, and I've managed to follow on um, some students right the way through their degree. So let me just share something different and have a look at what we're doing with our word cloud. So, uh, woo, awesome, brilliant. Um, so yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, and it's uh, increasing, that's really, really nice. So expectations, that's a really interesting uh, um, comment there in terms of, you know, students not necessarily knowing what they're, they're going to face. And that's something I'll, I'll pick up on later. So that's really, really good. Fear, oh, that's interesting. Um, trepidation of going to university. Yeah, and there's a whole load of other things there as well. So, you know, cultural adaptation, um, lack of a personal network, brilliant. I'll talk about that. Um, finding their way around, self-efficacy, um, independence, communication. Oh, brilliant. That's absolutely wonderful um, ideas there. And I'll pick up on some of those. But what I was hoping really to get across with this is that it's complex and students um, are facing a large number of different factors, all of which are bombarding them as they're trying to start their course and start learning. So I'll talk a little bit about the challenges they, they face regarding them. So thank you uh, for those. Um, I'll share something different. <clears throat> so one of those challenges is the development of self-regulated learning. And what do I mean by self-regulated learning? It has lots of different terms that mean roughly the same sort of thing. But there's various different models of that. It's how you manage your own learning approaches. And this is one by Lehman, um, who's one of the sort of major players in this area. And Lehman divides it into three main domains or dimensions, he calls them. The cognitive dimension, so what you're learning, um, how you're actually learning those, those facts and figures and applying that knowledge. The metacognitive dimension, which is how you structure that knowledge, how you regulate what you learn and how you learn and whether you know whether you're learning it right or not. Um, and the motivational dimension, which is you know, why you're learning, your interests, your beliefs, your motivations, your, uh, your aims and your goals. He also divides it into a structural and a processual component. So structural being the things you have to have and processual being ones that you have to do or develop. A similar uh, model, which is something I'll come back to later in this talk, is by uh, Monique Burkhartz, who uh, 
um, again, talks about those three different domains, the cognitive, metacognitive and uh, motivational. Um, and she interestingly puts them in a series of concentric circles, which I think is an interesting concept that in order to regulate your cognitive strategies, you need to be able to cope with your metacognitive approaches. In order to be able to regulate your metacognitive approaches, you need to be able to regulate yourself and regulate your aims and your, your, um, your goals. There's one circle missing in that that I think, and I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. So the methodology I used um, was a qualitative methodology um, and it's over about five or six years now. Um, I've followed about sort of 50, 60 students um, in various means, either myself or with um, the assistance of students. And some of them I've just followed for a single year. Some of them I followed all the way through their degree. Um, and some of them um, I'm halfway through. So there's a series of medical students, for example, there they've just finished their third year out of five. And it's based on um, interviews. So I have a series of interviews through the year. Um, they're open, intensive interviews. So I ask open questions like, can you tell me about this or what's your feeling about so-and-so? Um, and I analyzed it using constructivist grounded theory, Kathy Sharmaz's approach of uh, a reimagination of grounded theory where you don't go into the data with any preconceptions, you see what comes out of the data and you form your theories from that. That's all I'm going to talk about methodology wise, but I can answer questions on that if you want to. Um, so why is transition a challenge? Um, why is it something that uh, students typically struggle with? And Vincent Tinto, way back in the 70s, um, started proposing models for this. Um, he was mostly interested in why students drop out of university, uh, which is quite an interesting uh, question to think about. Um, but I'm really interested in what are the challenges facing students to enter what we would often rec regard as the academy, so the idea of academia. And what we're trying to do, I think most people in higher education would agree, although that's a very dangerous thing to say, um, is we're trying to aim our students when they graduate to have these sort of the higher order skills of Bloom's taxonomy. Now, you know, Bloom's taxonomy is older than I am and uh, it's been kicked around a lot. And, but I think a lot of it still, still holds true. I like this reimagining a bit where the top three tiers of Bloom's taxonomy are equivalent to each other rather than um, hierarchical. But what we're trying to do is get students to be analytical, to be evaluative, to create new ideas and new knowledge. Um, and getting them to that point is kind of what we're trying to do um, as they go through university. I've got another question for you, which would be interesting to see uh, people's responses to. So if you go back to uh, your, your Mentimeter, um, either on your phone or your, your screen, um, there should be a different question there. Um, series of three questions and it's a slider so um, I'd like you to go from strongly disagree to strongly agree and let's see what people think about that it's looking at different capabilities that we think students either have or develop um, while they're at university so I'll, I'll pop over and see see what we've got with that Ooh, okay interesting just leave it for a few more people to uh, to pop their opinions in. Don't know if anyone's used Mentimeter as part of their teaching, online teaching, but I use it all the time. It's great for engaging the students um, and getting them to talk about things. Brilliant. So that's really interesting. So yeah, looking at do students have the academic skills they need when they come to university? Pretty much people verging on the side of no. Um, so that, that's, that's really interesting. And same with, are they good at self-regulated learning? Again, people are sort of on the, the more negative side. And it's encouraging that people think they've improved while they're at university. But, you know, what's interesting is there's, very, there's no one actually who's <laughs> put five um, for that or, you know, right at strongly, strongly agree. So uh, um, that's quite an interesting point. And, you yeah, know, that's, that's a problem, I think, for, for higher education. Interesting, thank you. It's really interesting. Um, let me go back to me blathering. So what I found, so this, these interpretations are all based on talking to students and analyzing the things they say about their experiences. 
Um, and what I what seems to be emerging from that is that during the transition to university, which takes place over at least the first year, possibly the first two years, um, it, you know, at, in the UK, our degrees are typically three year degrees. Um, they go through three fairly distinct stages. So to start with, they're focusing on finding out, finding their feet. So one thing in particular they're trying to do is become an independent person. So for a lot of people, that's the first time they've been away from home, the first time they're having to do things like cooking and, and laundry and shopping and managing their finances and that sort of thing. And as you see from Penny here, who was a history um, undergraduate, and actually quite a capable and independent person herself, um, she was saying, yeah, that's a real problem. I'm having to cope with doing all of those things for the first time. And they're able to cope with that and they cope with that fairly rapidly. So certainly by looking at and support the support from other people around them, they develop those strategies very, very quickly or relatively quickly at least. So Zach here you know, is talking about how it's useful because he's living with people of his own age who are all in the same boat and they're all learning together, almost kind of like a community of practice. What's interesting about that is that it does seem to limit them doing other things. And there's a reason for this. Um, so Grace, who again, before she came to university was a very independent um, character. She really taught herself quite a lot during her pre-university um, education. Um, and she's saying she's just overwhelmed with things. There's so many things bombarding her um, that she's finding it difficult to focus on studying. There's, she's trying to do so many different things. And this is a very interesting paper. I'll share the link to that on the chat at the end. Um, that actually Car Carol Evans <laughs> of, the, uh, of the IFNTF um, showed me earlier today, um, which sort of validated some of the things I'd found. And what um, Friedlander and co um, point out, this is an interesting paper because it talks about 10 elements of neurobiology that impact on learning at high, in higher education. And one of those is the fact that you can only focus on a certain number of things at a time. So, you know, whilst you're focusing on one thing, you're not being able to absorb the information from a range of other things. And that's quite an important thing to think about when we think about the transition to university, because what we tend to do when students come to university is the first week or two weeks, we bombard them with lots of stuff, lots of information that they need to know for the course and assume from that point onwards that they've understood it. Whereas actually they're focusing so much on certain things that a lot of that will just go straight in one ear and out of the other. So that's an interesting point. The other thing they do is they are revising the way that they learn. Um, and I refer to these as personal learning strategies because they're very individual um, and they're generally developed by that individual through a series of, a long series of trial and error. Um, and they learn how to do specific things at school in a very strategic way. So for example, if you are studying maths, the way you study it and the way you revise is you practice. You find a formula and you practice it again and again and again. You do paper after paper after paper after paper. Um, and uh, sorry, I've, sorry, just noticed people were making some comments in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with um, biology, for example, you memorize processes, you memorize sequences of events. Um, what I found interesting and quite disappointing really was with English literature, where they study, for example, Hamlet for two years. I thought that they'd study the themes and the concepts behind that, but no, they learn a whole load of quotes and then they fit them in as they need to within the, uh, the essay that they're having to write in their exam. So they've defined a whole load of different strategies. When they come to university, they've now got to revise those strategies because they're doing things differently. So in uh, chemistry, for example, they're they've got a much broader amount of information they've got to cope with, a lot of it linking together, a lot of it quite new. With English literature, they're not focusing on one single book or three single books for two years. They're looking at a broad range of books and having to read lots of books again and again and again. Um, and a lot of them find they don't do that. They just focus on the one book that they need to do their exam or their, their essay on. So there's a load of different skills that they need to renegotiate, but they all have very defined sets of those skills. So I would argue that actually when they come to university, they are good at self-regulated learning in a lot of cases, 
but not necessarily in the way that we want it to be um, at university. The other thing that you see very early on is they know that university is different. They know that they're supposed to be doing something else, something extra, but they don't necessarily know what that is. And you've got a good um, couple of examples here. Um, so Andrew saying, yeah, he, he knows it's about independent study and you've got to do other stuff. And there's, there's something else you need, but he's not quite sure what, what it is. Rashid, um, you know, saying, yeah, I'm going to be treated differently. I'm not going to be taught. So it's going to be more independent. But, you know, I don't really know what that will be. So that's a, a key point they get to um, in that, what I would say, that first stage. The second stage um, is where they're trying to define the rules of the game. Um, and they're trying to work out what they need to do to do that something else. Um, at university. And I chose this image quite deliberately because when you talk to them, there's very much a sense of they're grasping at something, but they can't quite get it. It's sort of almost like the sand running through their fingers. They, they're aware it's there, uh, but they can't quite shape it into the thing that they want. And what you often see is they cling to something that's tangible to them, that they can understand and they can conceptualize. I refer to these as familiar unfamiliarities. So it's something that they can conceptualize, but they just don't know how to do. So with the science students and medical students, it tends to be focusing on the workload and trying to manage the vast amount of information that's been thrown at them. But then they often have a problem is how far does that go? They don't have a gauge for how much extra reading, how much extra information they need to get. With English literature students, it was very interesting that they almost universally focused on a very odd referencing system that they have at our university. Um, they knew what referencing was, they knew why they needed to do it, they knew what the idea behind it was, they just couldn't work out how to do that particular format um, correctly. So they really focused on that because, you know, it seemed to be because that was something they could actually succeed at. They could, that was a goal they could achieve by mastering that. And that sort of masks the fact that they don't really know what they're expected to do academically. So to a certain extent, there's that sort of feeling that, you know, I don't know if you've ever played the uh, children's game of pinning the tail on the donkey where you uh, blindfold the child and spin them around and they've got to put the pin in the right place on the, uh, on the donkey's bottom. Um, it's a bit like that. You get that very strong sense of they, they're trying lots of different things, but not necessarily realising whether they're getting it right or not. Come to stage three, and that's the point where they really start understanding what it's all about. And you can see that sort of almost light bulb moment happening. Them. Um, there's one student, Andrew, the one I quoted slightly earlier, when I talked to him at the beginning of the second year, he said, essentially, I get it now. It's about understanding a body of literature. That's why I've been asked to read all these books, which is quite difficult when you're interviewing someone because you're sitting there going, why didn't you understand that in the first place? But uh, um, it's something they need to, to gain that realisation of. Um, and Fionn, for example, here is saying, right, yes, I understand now what it's about. Uh, I'm not learning the ideas in a lecture. I'm getting different perspectives on some core concepts, but it's up to me to decide what I believe. And that happens at different points, which is quite interesting. So Fionn, for example, who, was, who wasn't very confident about her academic ability, she was, she was capable, but she, she saw herself as very much an imposter. Um, she got it pretty much like that. You know, between interview one and interview two, she understood what, she was, what academia was about. Mary, who was a lot more independent, a lot more confident of herself, took a lot longer um, to understand that. And she understood the importance of reading, but didn't really understand what the context of it was. Jane still didn't understand it by the end of year one. And it was only at the beginning of year two that she's really got the reason why she's being asked to read 10 books rather than one. And uh, that made it quite frustrating for her. She couldn't understand why she was being asked to do these ridiculous tasks or ridiculous to her anyway. So that, again, learning those rules and um, coming to that understanding takes a while and sometimes a year, sometimes half a year, sometimes more than a year. The other thing that happens quite clearly at stage three 
um, is they're reshaping who they are and who they think they are and what they think about themselves. What's interesting, if you talk to them about their identity and ask them to describe themselves, is they typically don't ally themselves with their discipline. So they will frequently say they're a student. So if I say, you know, if you were to introduce yourself to someone at a party, someone you've never met and say, you know, that person says, hi, I'm Steve, I'm an architect, what do you do? What would you say? They say, a lot of them would say, I'm a student. Some of them would say, I'm a student at Cardiff University. Fionn, interestingly, said, I'm a student and a mother because she had a, a little girl. Um, very few of them said, I'm a student of my discipline. So I'm a student of chemistry, I'm a student of history or so on. And only one of the original ones, that, uh, 24 that I looked at, um, really described himself as essentially a trainee chemist. Medical students are quite different to that. So medical students very early on identify themselves as medical students or trainee doctors. Um, they tend not to identify themselves as something else. So those are how, some sorts of stages. You might think, well, why can't we help them through with that? But uh, again, a question I ask them at the end of every year that I've interviewed um, these students, so I, I call it my TARDIS question for anyone who knows Doctor Who. Um, I say, if you could travel back in time and talk to yourself in enrolment week, in the very, very first week of your university experience, what would you say to yourself? If anything. A few of them say, do this or go to that lecture or, or try that approach. But the vast, vast majority of them say, I wouldn't say anything or I wouldn't give them any advice. All I would say is, don't worry, you'll be fine. You'll get used to it. Um, you, you'll understand it. It'll, it'll all come right in the end. So there's very much this sense that that learning journey is a very important rite of passage. For medical students, it's almost like a hazing that they, uh, they have to get through that really, really tough um, first bit of the medical course. Um, but for most of them, it's, they see it as a journey. They see it as a, a period of development. That's very, very strong in the first year less so in the second, third, fourth year and so on. So what are the key factors um, that uh, influence that? And that's the thing I really wanted to, uh, to talk in a lot of detail about. So with self-regulated learning, that's obviously the development of that as a, as a concept is something that's very, very important in trying to support them in that. What you find is they've already done an awful lot of the things that typically we try and tell them what to do in study skilled sessions. So with year one students, it's very common to have a introductory sessions on this is how you learn at, learning at university. We used to, for example, in, in our sessions, talk about mind maps, you know, the sort of spider diagram type thing. That's a really good way to learn. Almost universally, the students I've talked to have done that to death at school and 80% of them hate it. Um, it doesn't work for them. They don't like it as a concept. So we're telling them something that's old news and something they've already discarded. So that's utterly pointless. So what instead we can do is help them to think about those different areas. So we can encourage them to think on the types of environments that help their learning, different strategies that they use. Um, we could sort of help them to reflect on what works and what doesn't for them and maybe talk to each other about that. Um, and we can maybe reflect them, ask them to reflect on why they're there, why they're doing things, what motivates them, what encourages them, what excites them, um, what things do they like doing as a, having as a reward um, for, for doing uh, an unpleasant activity like studying. Well, studying is unpleasant for a lot of students, not all of them. Um, so there are things we can do to help them rationalise those, those areas. An assessment can... Um, play a big role in that as well. So I'm doing a lot of work with Carol Evans, who's one of the former um, co-presidents um, of the IFNTF, one of the founders of it, um, on her EAT framework, her um, equity agency and transparency framework for um, assessment. And I'll talk a little bit about a project at the end that you might be interested in. Um, these are three things that really come out of her analysis that she's done on that of of what makes an effective assessment. So she talks about agentic engagement, so engaging students actively so they own the process. 
She talks about assessment literacy, getting students to understand the requirements of an assessment and um, what the context of that assessment looks like. But at the centre of it all is the ability to self-regulate, the ability to understand how you learn, how you remember information, how you apply that information and to manage those cognitive processes. So it's absolutely the centre um, of assessment. And assessment is one of the things that helps drive learning. So we can, if we build in self-regulation into our assessments, we can help the students um, develop those skills. We've actually developed a, um, a little sort of instrument to sort of help you evaluate your assessments to see whether you're um, helping driving those self-regulation skills as well. And again, I'll talk about that. It's part of this uh, project that we're doing that's funded by the European Union. So self-regulation is one thing that leads to your motivations and your sense of um, individuality and your sense of agency as a learner and as a student. This again is um, the outcomes of um, looking at the data of, in several ways. And this is something called a, a positional map um, from situation analysis by uh, um, Adele Clark. Um, and what it's doing is looking at the behaviors or the, um, the positions that people take if they're on one of two different dimensions, one of two different axes. So at the bottom, I've got motivation. So for low motivation ones, those are ones who are just at university because they just need to go to university or because that's the next thing they do. The ones on the high end are ones who are really interested in history or really want to be a doctor or really interested in their particular subject. And the other one is their perceived academic ability. I didn't ever have, have a measure, an accurate measure of their academic ability. I could only go by what they reported to me. And if you're ones that are both low for motivation and perceived academic ability, then it's very much other people's problem. So you don't really know why you're studying. You're doing it because you're being told to. You're, you blame other people for your failures. You're more likely to drop out or fail or have to resit. Um, whereas if you're highly motivated by the subject and see yourself as being quite academically capable, um, it's almost the opposite of that, unsurprisingly. You're very driven, you prefer solitary study, um, you're very motivated by are you getting your value for money, but you're also frustrated by the fact that you're not being pushed enough, you're not sort of going as far as you want to. And there are var vagaries um, in the other dimensions with there as well. Interestingly, those who don't see themselves as capable, but are really, really interested in the subject, those are the ones that find it frustrating that they can't understand what they're supposed to be doing, but they desperately, desperately want to. And those are the ones I think we really, really need to help. Cool. That age, sense of agency also reflects, um, as I said, their reshaping of their identity and then rethinking who they are and where they are in the world. And that's a very important thing for a young person, as you, as you know. And it's linked up with their perception of agency as well. So they're in a new environment, they're alone, often for the first time, they're living on their own, they need to be self-reliant. And there's a whole load of different questions floating around that come out of the interviews that when you're talking to them. Why are they at university? Are they going to succeed at university? Are they going to make friends? Um, What's their purpose within the world as a whole? How do they fit in? Are they able to uh, um, succeed at university? And all of those different identity questions are underpinned by the really big identity questions around um, gender identity or ethnicity identity or class or sexuality or any of those really, really big constructs. So they're having to deal with all of those. And there are different motivators and drivers that again come out um, when you're talking to the students. There are some that are internalized. Um, so personal motivations, personal drivers that drive the shaping of their identity. There are also ones that are uh, their own perceptions of their strengths and their own perceptions of their weakness. And then in the top and, and left, you've got the external ones. So either the external motivators for either their friends, their family, society or whatever, and also projected identities that you have from uh, from society. So in terms of their, for example, their social uh, identity, their ethnicity, their gender identity, um, perception of students within the media in general, um, and those sorts of things. 
And those again, all interact with each other and all feed off each other. So your own personal identity at the center is, is impacted by a series of personal um, related factors, such as your own goals, your journey through life, um, whether you've succeeded at things, your fear of failure, that sort of stuff. Those themselves are impacted by societal pressures um, and societal pressures on young people are quite intense at the moment, especially from things like social media and whatnot. And then, sorry, social pressure. And then you've got the bigger societal pressures um, of you know, being part of an ethnic group or uh, media representations of, of universities or the structure of universities and those sorts of things. So all of those focus in on shaping that identity. And I said there were sort of three stages. There's also what seem to be three different communities of practice that the students inhabit at different points. And these are very much over overlapping. And I am using the phrase communities of practice in its proper sense, as in the Lave and Benga um, sense of the word, um, because they are communities of people who share a common goal and are working towards that common goal. So the very first one, the basic one, is this idea of becoming an independent adult, of being able to survive on your own in the big, hard, scary world. That requires a number of different things to master. Once you've mastered those, you can sort of move across a bit more to the community of being a, a university learner. So you're someone who's able to study on their own, who has revision skills and understands the... Uh, um, the academic skills you need at university and that's not necessarily um, discipline specific. Then you've got the understanding of the conventions, um, the traditions, the, uh, the biases, the ideas within your discipline itself. So there are certain things that as a historian you need to know to be a historian or as an engineer you need to know to be an engineer. And they overlap um, quite considerably. And there are some things where, that are shared between all three of those um, communities of practice, but they develop in slightly different ways. And again, if you think about what I was saying before about that cognitive load and the focus that they have. So if students are really, really focusing on being an independent adult at the beginning of their course, they're not able to really focus on all of these other things that we've got hidden over here. Um, and so things such as doing their doing revision skills, study skills, written skills and so on are things that they won't be able to really get to grips with until they se se settle themselves within this community of practice. And even worse, understanding the conventions of the discipline, they need to have not negotiated two different stages, two different communities of practice to get to that point. And that I think is an interesting thing to think about when it comes to designing courses and uh, um, introductory courses in particular. How do they develop those? Um, sorry, that was just to emphasize that some of these things are mutual to all of them. And so if you want to help them migrate in those different communities, emphasizing those are very, very important things to do. Building academic relationships and building personal learning networks, which is in the title of my talk. So that leads me on to talk about the fact that this process is innately social. Um, it involves negotiated interactions, negotiated um, relationships with people. So if you think of, for example, a series of social arenas that the students operate in, big, big, broad concepts. So I've got here, for example, the university as a big, broad concept. Um, the discipline itself is a big broad concept and then the non-university environment. So the discipline and the university environment intersect with each other to a certain extent. If you then put um, social worlds that the students exist in, which are small um, sort of functional groups, then this is the sort of uh, pattern that you see. So you can see that some of those social worlds inhabit one or the other or both of those um, social arenas and they overlap with each other to a certain extent. And you've got the student here in the centre, well, almost the centre, um, mostly within the university, partly within the discipline um, and a little bit in the outside world as well. If you look at them developing as an independent person, they do that mostly, it seems, by interacting with their, the, student, the people they live with or with whom they live, um, their family to a certain extent, but a very limited extent. 
and to again to a minor extent the peers they have on their course when it comes to becoming a self-regulated learner it's almost exclusively their students they share accommodation with and those that they share a course with very very little if any impact um, from the academic staff from the students perspective but then when it comes to learning about the discipline it's the academic staff and their peers on the course um, that really help them do that so by the different impact of those different social groups helps them move and understand those three different communities of practice so those individuals there academic staff course peers domestic peers and family seem to be the most important ones for students certainly the ones I, i've talked to so how can we support that as a process um well i think we need to really think about what we say to students and how we interact with them um so we've got the student there in the center the academic member of staff the lecturer or um or class leader has a role to do with that of talking about the discipline giving them ideas and about the concepts and the conventions of that discipline a mentor or a personal tutor um, can have a reciprocal dialogue with that it's a bit less one way postgraduate teaching uh, assistants or postgraduate tutors can also have a bit of a role with that and it's important to really emphasize to them the impact that they can have on students especially during that first year of their education and then there's also these peers on the course and uh, the peers that they share accommodation with but these are less to do with understanding entry into the academy, but more to do with settling in um, as university individuals. So those support networks are very important. And the major impact on them is certainly in year one, but also very strongly in years two and three as well, is the domestic peers. So those students they share accommodation with who they see quite regularly social peers and academic peers again quite important but actually the impact the teacher or the tutor has is fairly minimal and that's because they're developing a personal learning network or they're reimagining their personal learning network now personal learning network is something you all have um, and it's a an association of either people or technologies or um, social groups or activities they do or actions they do um that help you understand or give you guidance in certain things so we're constantly re-evaluating and reshaping our personal learning network so for example if i need if i've got a problem with my car the first person i call is my dad um a, a while ago um i couldn't get a cd out of my cd player um my dvd player so i went on youtube to find out how to do that so you have different go-to places um to get information from and students have that established personal learning network when they're at school. When they come to university, it's blown out of the water because 90% of the people that are part of that personal learning network have gone. Um, and so what you find is they reevaluate that and fill those different areas with a whole load of different things. And what they do is they make those personal learning networks reciprocal. So, and that does tend to be discipline specific. So a English student, for example, will often be the person who proofreads everyone else's work for them. Um, a math student will be the person who helps them with any sort of calculations or, or any sort of, sort of scientific sort of planning. And they very neatly fit in to make a, a big sort of super network, a very connective, connected collective um, of individuals. Now that can be disrupted by certain things as I'll come to hopefully later if I've got time. So this is a model of that I, I put together, which shows the various different impacts with that. So they've got their prior experience of school, whether, you know, they, whether collab collaborative activities were discouraged or encouraged at school um, or required. They've got their own personality, of course. So extroverts and introverts will form per personal learning networks differently, um, whether they're really enthusiastic about the subject or whether they're um, really interested in supporting other people. There's academic factors in terms of do they need help? Um, is there a reason for them establishing this, um, this network? On the right, we've got structural activities within the course itself. So are there collaborative activities 
built into the course that helps students develop these particular um, elements. And then there's the actual social interactions they have with their um, peers and the people who teach them and so on. So quite importantly, I think there's a, a circle missing from this self-regulated learning um, model of Burkhart's and that's the regulation of interactions with others. So you can do all of that self-regulation you want, but actually fundamentally underlying all of that is that social um, element, that uh, interaction with others and mediating that and sort of managing how much people influence you, how much you uh, rely on them and so on. And so, as I said, rather arrogantly, I, I prefer the term student mediated learning because it's not quite as egocentric. It's not quite as solitary sounding as self-regulated learning. It's, it's still a very social um, effect. Just very quickly, I uh, just wanted to talk about um, how that's been disrupted over the last year. So this nasty little uh, um, thing has disrupted all of us um, to greater or lesser extents and some very extreme extents, of course, over the last year. But certainly in educational terms, it's caused big problems. Um, this is some um, data from some students of mine um, talking to final year students and medical students. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about these findings, but essentially what they found is that there were some good things and some bad things relating to it. Um, but in all of those cases, it was a significant disruption to the students. And they had to change how they were doing things. They had to change their um, learning strategies. They had to change how they um, interacted with others. And this is something, again, from one of my students. It's very clear that they sometimes have good days and sometimes have bad days. They're good days, they, they're motivated, they're, they're pushing, they're, they're, they're driving forward. On bad days, they really have problems getting motivated and being um, regulated in their, in their learning. We'll just very quickly um, gloss over these. These are from some other students of mine, but it just shows if you look at these again, are first year medical students they've interviewed, um, looking at the things that come out of the analysis, they're looking at um, the barriers to their learning, identity and self-efficacy and the social environment seem to be major things that come out of that. Um, I don't have time to talk about these, but they do actually develop as they go through the year. So they did change, they did adapt, they did, um, overcome these problems over time. But the major problem with the personal learning networks is they innate, innately need that social contact. And so if you've got people in a socially distanced environment, you're going to, they're coming from a, a, a socially distanced environment, so that's impacted. You're impacting their interactions they have on their course, and you're impacting the opportunities they have to collaborate on the course as well. And so we need to think about those and how we ameliorate those to help those students develop those important personal learning networks as they go through their course. Okay, so just another couple of moments and I'll just quickly run through what I think are some implications and ways we can sort of support students in that transition. So firstly, teaching study skills I don't think is necessary, but helping the students reevaluate their study skills is vitally important. So we need to get them talking to each other. We need to get them sharing ideas, sharing experiences and experimenting as, as to what works. They can only focus on a few things at once. So don't overload them at the very beginning of the course. If you've got important stuff to tell them, wait until they've settled into university before you tell them that. Um, this is actually a picture of Striding Edge, which is a very narrow bit of uh, um, one of the mountains in the Lake District where, yeah, if you, if you don't look, if you don't look where you're going, you'll fall off. Help the students redefine their self-regulated learning strategies by talking to each other. Get them to discuss those strategies with each other and give them time to try new approaches, new ideas. Social interactions are vitally important. So do any sort of social interactions you can to help the students develop those peer support networks. Um, if you don't have that within your course, build it in. Um, get some sort of group work, some sort of social activity, even if it's just a let's get together and have a cup of tea. Helping them to redefine those personal learning networks is very important. Helping them to help develop those and build those relationships and find out who knows what so that they can find out who to pigeon where in that personal learning network. 
and that's in particularly important um, while they're being socially distanced and in online um, learning. Give them a little trail of ideas to learn those rules of the game, the conventions of the discipline. Don't tell them in one in one go. Give them little, like a little trail of breadcrumbs that leads them to that understanding. Because if they come to that understanding themselves, it's much more powerful um, than if we tell them. If we tell them, and certainly if we tell them too soon, they just won't get it. Match the practice the students have to their expectations. It's interesting that expectations with the big word um, in the word cloud at the very beginning. So that fits quite nicely. Um, they do have expectations of what um, to uh, expect to university, and they know it's going to be different. So help them understand that difference. Identity starts very early. They'll shape their identity from the moment they walk in the door. Um, and focus on when, when you, they talk about their identities, they tend to be very negative. So help them focus on what they are rather than what they're not and help them find out where they fit in help them sort of survive um, by finding out where they fit in in the crowd and collaborative activities help them do that awesome so i just want to acknowledge a few um people who've been instrumental in that so professor elizabeth mccrum and dr naomi flynn um, of the university of reading a lot of this work um, began in an, an ed d that i did with them um, Professor Carol Evans for being quite inspirational and some good ideas. Um, Susie, Matthew, Michelle, Hannah, Emily, Lydia and Matthew are all students who've done some of this work with me and of course the participants themselves. Um, and the work was funded um, partially by the National Teaching Fellowship um, um, scheme in the UK and by Erasmus Plus. And just to spend one minute, that Erasmus Plus um, project I mentioned is an EU funded project between five different universities in the EU. And what we're trying to do is apply Carol's EAT framework and develop resources for um, assessment and feedback and improving assessment processes. And we're looking for people to do case studies of the EAT framework and um, work to change some of their assessment practices. So if you'd be interested, drop either me a line or that um, email address eat-erasmus at cardiff.ac.uk. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Jotham Vaulichi, as they say in Wales, I'll probably pronounce that wrong. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.